time presenting, ladies and gentlemen. Hard Boyle Haggerty in the ring now. Today is the heyday of the pretty boy. Kowalski is called killer for Dr. Gene Stanley of Chicago. She likes it. Oh, boy, that can hurt. Right here at ringside while we go in for a riot of rough house that's finally called wrestling. It is July 20th, 1973, and in the arena in Houston, Texas, the reigning blonde NWA World Heavyweight Wrestling Champion, Harley Race, is taking on the 31-year-old challenger, Jack Briscoe. Briscoe is the new darling of the wrestling world. His opponent, Harley Race, will not go quietly into the night. It is a vicious battle, with Briscoe hurling Race into the ring ropes. For Briscoe, this fight is the opportunity of a lifetime and will make Briscoe one of the icons of wrestling. Jack Briscoe had been born in Blackwell, Oklahoma on September the 21st, 1941. He was christened Freddie Joe Briscoe. He was born into a poor family suffering from hard times, as was at that time most of Oklahoma. For the world in general, this was a momentous year. Europe was in flames as the German military machine smashed its way across Europe and into the USSR, while England, specifically London, was under a full-scale German aerial attack. Rommel and the Africa Corps were also creating havoc in the Middle East. Back in the USA, President Roosevelt had met with England's Prime Minister Winston Churchill, and war looked ever more ominous for the states. But life goes on. In Oklahoma, it still moved at its own pace. Cab Calloway was playing at the Trianon Ballroom singing his famous Heidi Heidi Ho. And believe it or not, a woman wrote to an Oklahoma City newspaper claiming all the current problems in the world had been brought about because women no longer wore corsets. Corsets and stays keep women and men more rigidly moral, she wrote. The Packard Clipper was the car of the day, and the Yankee Clipper, Joe DiMaggio, hit safely in 56 straight games. In America's number one entertainment business, Walt Disney's Dumbo opened. As a matter of fact, 1941 was a bumper year for movie classics. They included the likes of the all-time classic Citizen Kane, starring Orson Welles. Crosby and Hope started out on the road to Zanzibar with the beautiful Dorothy L'Amour, while Humphrey Bogart brought us the Maltese Falcon. 1941 was also a good year for a former NFL football player. His name, Bronco Nagurski. He held the wrestling title having just defeated the likes of a young Lou Thez. But by December the 7th, all of America woke up to a day of infamy as Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. Nothing would ever be the same again. It took four agonizing years before the free world could celebrate victory against the Nazis and Japan. By now, the young Jack Briscoe had reached the tender age of four, but he still remembers those tough family times. My family situation was very tough. My mom and dad split when I was very young, and uh, he took off for California. My mom raised me and my brothers and sisters, and uh, we really didn't know him. Well, mostly we spent the time uh, just with each other, because my mom had to go to work and uh, to su su uh, support us, and she. Uh, was a waitress in a restaurant and uh, trying to support uh, six children, which was almost, it was difficult to do, it was almost impossible. Well, I was, uh, you know, we were a very poor family and we were struggling and uh, just to put food on the table and a lot of times in the winter times we didn't have electricity in the house and it was about to freeze to death and I was always trying to figure out how in the world was to get out of this situation. I knew that I was a good athlete and I knew the only way to get out of this situation was to really work hard at school and work hard as an athlete and maybe someday be able to go to college and get uh, my family out of this poverty. Well, I started uh, uh, playing football and, and wrestling and I became very well of it. I was fortunate enough to have a very good coach 
My coach's name was uh, Chuck Hetrick. He was a national champion at uh, Oklahoma State University, and he started coaching me wrestling when I was uh, 15 years old as a sophomore in, in high school. And uh, he told me if I worked hard that, uh, that I could really be good at it. So that gave me a lot of incentive. And I worked tremendously hard at it. In my first year as a sophomore, I became Oklahoma heavyweight state champion. And in my junior year, I repeated again as Oklahoma state heavyweight champion. My senior year, I pinned every man I wrestled. and never even had a point scored against me. And I won a scholarship to Oklahoma State University. And went to Oklahoma State. I was two-time Big 8 champion, two-time All-American at Oklahoma State. While I was there, the local promoter, uh, Leroy McGurk, who promoted uh, professional wrestling in Oklahoma, came to see me and asked me if I was interested in wrestling pro. Of course, that's what I'd always wanted to do, was to be a pro wrestler. I told him, sure. So Leroy took me under his wing, moved me to Tulsa from Oklahoma State, which was in Stillwater, Oklahoma and trained me to be a, a professional wrestler and it started me there in Oklahoma. I turned professional in 1965. I had my first uh, match on television, which was in Oklahoma City that did the taping on Saturday nights then. And my first match was against uh, Ronnie Garvin, which, who later became world's heavyweight champion himself. And uh, we wrestled uh, for about 10 minutes and then I, I beat him. But during the match, he. Uh, threw an elbow over behind him, hit me in the eye, and busted my eye open. So I, was, I had my eye busted open the first night we were uh, in the wrestling. Just eight years later, in 1973, on July the 20th, in the arena in Houston, Texas, Jack Briscoe was to defeat the reigning wrestling champion, the blonde Harley Race, and claim the undisputed NWA World Heavyweight Championship of professional wrestling. Harley Race was one of the toughest guys I've ever been in the ring with. He was, Harley was not as good a wrestler as Junior, but he was a lot meaner. He was more of a, a street brawler, more of a, uh, knew how to do all the dirty tricks and wasn't afraid to do it. And uh, when you got in the ring with Harley, you were in a dog fight every time you got in the ring with Harley. So he was one of the toughest guys that I'd ever faced. Harley had been one of my adversaries for quite a few years, and him and I and Dory Funk Jr. would go back and forth and back and forth. We were the three top contenders for the championship, so I had a match scheduled with Harley in, in Houston, Texas, and it was a two out of three fall match, and he took the first fall, and I won the second fall. And uh, I had been working, uh, working out with a guy named Lou Fez, one of the greatest wrestlers of all time, and Lou had taught me his body press that he used coming off the ropes. So I was in the match and got an opportunity to try this body press and, and I did it and I pinned Harley to win, to win the World's Heavyweight Championship. And uh, the people went crazy, it was a sellout crowd and I went crazy and it was just a wonderful feeling. And, and uh, there and all of a sudden I found myself standing in the middle of the ring with my hand raised and the World champ, Heavyweight Champion with that solid gold belt around my waist and it was a great thrill. Uh, ticket prices were raised about five dollars. Uh, you know, when you come into Los Angeles or San Francisco, Jack Briscoe was on the card, and that was the first time for any NWA World Champion they would up the price of the tickets because they know they could get it. People wanted to see this guy who had the Adonis looks and skill, and just I saw 90-minute what we call Broadway's draws that Jack had with Dory Jr. and Harley Race and uh, Ed Carpentier from Montreal, and oh. Those were dream matches. Anything with Jack Briscoe in it, a five-star match. And that's how others in the business and photographers and people and historians that cover the business view Jack Briscoe as a five-star, world-class, one of the greatest. And of course, Luthes is favorite after uh, Dick Hutton. So that went on for about a year. It didn't matter. It seemed like who I wrestled there for just almost a year, just some automatic sellouts everywhere I went. And that's when my name started getting out around the country. And in 71, I started going out to different places like St. Louis and selling out St. Louis with all the top guys and in, in all around the world and across the country. And then my name got into uh, uh, North Carolina and Jim Crockett Sr. was promoting there and he started bringing me in for shots there. And same thing, just sell out after sell out. And I ended up going to uh, New York City with Vince McMahon, worked Madison Square Garden, which was was the thrill of my life. I'd always heard of Madison Square Garden, always wanted to perform there. For Jack Briscoe, the 70s was his time to soar to new heights.
Jack had returned to the ring with a vengeance, winning in 73 the NWA belt from Harley Race, then fighting his way across the USA, including this fight against Don Morocco. Jack shocked the wrestling world when he became the first American champion to defend his title in Japan. His opponent, Japan's wrestling immortal, Giant Bala. Just 17 months after winning the title, Jack did something that was to shock the wrestling world by putting his title on the line in Japan, something no other wrestling champion had ever ventured. His opponent was the enormous Japanese wrestling idol, Giant Barber. The first championship match took place on the 2nd of December, 1974, in Kogoshimi, Japan. Barber's size and weight proved to be an almost insurmountable task as Jack proceeded to receive a real pounding. It was all too obvious this could not go on indefinitely, and eventually Jack succumbed. Giant Barber was the new champion, much to the delight of his adoring fans. Giant Barber uh, was a huge man. He was like six foot six, weighed about uh, 275 pounds, a big Japanese fellow. And um, he was a really good, good, tough wrestler. So I signed a 30-day contract with him. I signed to, to defend my title in Tokyo against him. And if, I had stipulations if he won, and I, a week later, I'd get him back in, in Tokyo again for a rematch. So the first night I would go into Tokyo, and uh, sure enough, I lost the title to Giant Baba. It was the first time a, a Japanese guy had ever won the World's Heavyweight Championship. Jack had obviously learned a lot from that first encounter with this terrifying opponent, and he put that knowledge to good use. Jack's years of hard work and wrestling ability took over, and using his vast array of wrestling maneuvers, he outwitted his opponent and won back his title. So uh, I had my return match with him a week later there in Tokyo, and I took the title back, and uh, grabbed the belt and jumped on the plane and went back home. Briscoe, another great amateur, you know, of course, and great world champion, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, just a great gentleman, uh, uh, the best, the best man. Probably one of the greatest uh, wrestlers that uh, the U.S. has produced. Um, great champion. He was to hold that title for one more year, fighting five and six times a week. His young good looks and sportsmanlike approach brought him many fans, fame, and fortune. But all good things eventually must come to an end. For Jack, that was on December the 10th, 1975, in Miami, Florida, when he lost his title to fellow American Terry Funk. Losing the heavyweight championship for the last time to Terry Funk in Miami Beach, Florida, I was scheduled to wrestle to, uh, Dory Funk Jr. in Miami Beach, and uh, something happened where Jr. couldn't make the match, and I was defending my title against Jr., and Terry came in to take Jr.'s place. And uh, I just don't think I was really prepared for that situation. I got in the ring with Terry, and uh, I has had a bad night, and I lost the title that night to Terry. and. Uh, I never was able to uh, get it back, so that was the end of my run as a, as a top wrestler in the world. Jack continued to fight all comers, both in the tag team events with his brother Jerry and just about every known opponent making the wrestling circuit. Amongst the most popular was Bobo Brazil, a really tough, mean and large wrestler. Together they always put on a great show for the fans. Here are some highlights from one of those fights. It took place in Japan in 1975. 
非常に腰の高い、ボボ、ブラジル、そしてロープに、ボール投げる、体当たり、左の方から入りました、ショルダーする、ショルダー、ショルダーアタック、はい、はい、正面から、バットが爆発、バットが爆発しました、ずれ落ちました、チャンピオン、チャンピオン、危うし、チャンピオン、危うし。全に動き集まりました。対角線上にボール投げる。コーナーゴーブラジル。さて、フィギュアフォーレッグロックリングの中央だ。ロープまでは足が通ったどうか。さあ入った。足飛し。フィギュアフォーレッグロック。足四の字に入り。対角線上に叩きつけます。初回のボボブラジルでございます。非常にこう両者が相対してもまず対角の比較をご紹介しますと、ジャックプレストが百八十八センチ、ボーブラジルが百九十七センチ。この後子供の違いがありますね。そうですね。えー、階級でもね、約50ポンドほどプラジルの方が多いですね。はい。まさしても出ました。黄金のヘッドパット、ここバットが出ました。早くトップバーに行きました。2本目、場外だ。場外に放り投げました。場外に放り投げました。リングの中は仁王立ち。ボーブラジル、あとボーブラジルも場外に行きました。激しい競争で場外に。木槌を持ちました。木槌を持ちました。それを喉元へチャンピオンの喉元へ刺しました。ルーファースもフォローに行きます。セコンドのルーファースもフォローに行きました。さあ、カウントを取りにああとダブルヘッドパット。これは叶えません。ああ、今度要請しましたね。今度要請しました。3本目。さあ、どういう結果になりますか？これは反則を取らないためですね。完全に2人がかりですからね。はい。Jack's wrestling career was to last another 10 years. During that time, there were frequent battles against the Funk family, both Terry and Dory Jr. But Jack never managed to reclaim his world title. But he did win various state and regional titles, and he and brother Jerry won almost 20 national tag team titles. Well, Jerry, he's、uh, he had been amateur wrestling with me, and I, I taught him when after I started amateur wrestling, I taught him how to wrestle amateur too.、And、of course, he was in the same school system, which had the wrestling programs with, with coaches. We just wrestled together as an amateurs all the way up. So after I turned pro, I taught him how to, to wrestle pro. So he was in college a couple more years after I left.、And、when he got out, I'd already taught him how to wrestle pro, and he had wrestled a few times. Professionally during the summertime between college、uh, years, and then after he got finished with college, I did like the same thing. Almost went through. I got him booked in、uh, in Australia to go to Australia for three months. I got him booked in Japan to go to Japan, and, and he just became very good at it. And、uh, ended up at the one time、uh, when I was world's heavyweight champion. My brother Jerry was world's junior heavyweight champion. We were the only two brothers in the history that ever accomplished that. Describe my style as basically collegiate due to my background, and then I, I mixed in the professional moves with it to to blend in. And、uh, I would describe my style as very scientific and very aggressive and very quick. That's what I, I attained my success to is, is my aggressiveness and my quickness, and always trying to think of holes, a few holes, four or five holes down the down the line. Fortunately, I, I always kept myself in, in very good conditioning. I never had a serious injury. I had a lot of、uh, a lot of bumps and bruises, a lot of sprains, but I never had an injury that caused me to miss a match. And、uh, I was very fortunate in that in, in that sense. And、uh, probably the toughest matches I have ever had was against Dory Funk Jr. As Dory Funk Jr., you couldn't you could not get him tired. He was just a, he was just a machine. Just go and go and go. You couldn't get him tired. He was one of the toughest, and I think the second toughest match was against Harley Race. By the mid '80s, for Jack, it was all over. Now he could look back at his many victories with pride, but for Jack, his greatest battle and his greatest victory was yet to come. I wake up on a Saturday morning, and I'm paralyzed from the chest down. I can't move. About five years ago, I was having a lot of back problems. My back was hurting quite a bit, and I'd been doing a lot of yard work in my yard at home.
and I thought I'd pulled a muscle in my back, but the problems kept continuing. I wake up on a Saturday morning, and I'm paralyzed from the chest down. I can't move. So I uh, get my wife up, and she uh, she tries to get me up, and she goes to calls the doctor, and the doctor says, well, you need to get into the emergency room right away. And uh, they ran tests on me probably eight, 10 hours, every kind of test you could known to man. And they found a growth that was wrapped around my spinal cord, and it was growing, and it choked off my nerves. And the doctor said it was about to kill me. It was already, it already taken everything, uh, everything away from me from the chest down. He said the next thing it was going to do was shut your lungs down. He said, we're going to have to get it out of there. So they tried to get it out of there. They didn't know what it was, so when they went to cut it out of there, it was a big kind of tumor-like thing. When they cut it, it was full of poison, and the poison spread all through my body and poisoned me. And so I went into shock or whatever, coma. That put me on life support systems. I was on life support for six days. When I finally come off of that, they put me in intensive care. I ended up in intensive care for 26 days and end up staying in the hospital altogether three months. And um, my wife took care of me every day. She, after three months in the hospital, I went home. They had a hospital bed for me at home. Having gone through that has really changed my attitude towards life. I appreciate being here every day. I'd like to thank my wife without her. I would have never made it. She took care of me and nursed me through all that, that bad time. Today, as a couple, Jack and Jan Briscoe are one of the great love stories of wrestling. And of course, as he credits her both publicly and in the book with saving his life. And she really did. Thank God for, for our business, wrestling, that Jan was around to save Jack. So I, I really. It's a real sweet lady, class, uh, classy lady, doesn't like to talk much, but uh, she is something else, and we, we really thank her for doing that uh, for us. Yeah, the doctor said, uh, there's no reason why I shouldn't be here. Whew, man. I felt like I lived it all over again. Today, Jack Briscoe lives out his retirement with his loving wife, Jan, in Florida, where he owns a successful auto body repair shop. But you can be sure his mind still goes back to the glory years of his wrestling career, one crowned with glorious achievements honored by all of his wrestling peers. In 1973, he was voted PWI Wrestler of the Year. He is a winner of the prestigious Lou Thez Award, as voted by his peers at the Cauliflower Alley Club and he has been inducted into the Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame. Some say a man is known best by his deeds. In the wrestling ring, Jax was self-explicit. In his private life, Jack cherishes his privacy and those of his loved ones. But one thing we do know for sure, and that is the good-looking boy from Oklahoma gained his fame and respect the old-fashioned way. He earned it. refer to your manuals.